morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, if it's okay with you, I tend to, to walk around. I, I'll try not to block the screen, but uh, I walk around a bit. So I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Watson. I'm assuming most of you are aware that Watson earned its fame when it defeated the reigning Jeopardy champions uh, just a little, little over about a year and a half ago in playing uh, Jeopardy. Um, it, Ken, uh, Ken Jennings was at that point the, the contestant who had won the most games um, playing Jeopardy, and Brad was the fellow who had won the most money. And Watson, in three sessions, um, defeated both of them. Um, Jeopardy, uh, Watson was not designed with the intention of playing Jeopardy. <laughs> Watson was designed as a challenge. A fellow named Dave Ferrucci, put, uh, starting in 2006, put this team together to create a computer that would could fundamentally understand English. As this thing from looking at words and finding words, actually understanding the meaning of difficult English. And uh, Jeopardy was an obvious arena in which to demonstrate that accomplishment. So it played Jeopardy again because that was, if it was successful in playing Jeopardy, then it would demonstrate that this was a very powerful tool for understanding the English language. Um, now, clear up a couple of things. Um, uh, after um, Watson was successful, uh, Ken wrote on his screen, erased his name, and wrote down, I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. Okay. <laughs> That was not our intent. Okay, I just want to, want to, want to clear that up. Uh, but fortunately um, for me, and I think for others, um, IBM senior le leadership recognized that playing Jeopardy was not a long-term business model. Okay. <laughs> Had to find something else. And so um, actually even before this program was taped, we started to focus on what Watson could do in healthcare. And uh, the success on Jeopardy actually created some problems for us because immediately after that third program was aired, it was actually taped a year ago, January, and, and televised in February, the media, and the media learned that we were working on Watson for healthcare, immediately there was this flourish of, of you know, uh, uh, Watson's gonna replace doc doctors, Dr. Watson is gonna do all this, we won't need doctors in the future, all sorts of over-the-top things that bore no relationship to reality, but created some, some challenges for us. So we had to very carefully explain what Watson's role would be and how it was not going to replace doctors or, or anybody else. Because the, the role we have, we have in mind for Watson because of its ability to understand English and read huge volumes. So for example, the version of Watson that played Jeopardy was able to read and understand 200 million pages of text in three seconds. Okay. A lot faster than I can read. And understands and remembers and prioritizes and knows what's relevant. Um, so that any area of human endeavor where a large amount of text-like information, what's called unstructured data, text-like, you know, the, you know, you know, vocal transcription or, or typed text or, or printed text, um, is, could be, uh, theoretically be used, um, uh, have a role for Watson. So we started talking about the, these different opportunities and got all this stuff about, about re re replacing. One of the first talks I gave about Watson was on the set of Watson. This was taped at our Yorktown Heights Laboratory, in the auditorium at the Yorktown Heights Laboratory. And uh, so for publicity reasons, that set was kept intact for some six or seven months. So shortly after this uh, program was, was televised, it was, I think that like a month later, I was on the set in the auditorium speaking to a group about, about Watson. And you know, I wanted to emphasize what, what Watson would do and that it, it's not gonna replace anybody. So it's just not gonna replace physicians. And um, I also want to talk about it's not going to replace other people to get in other, other areas. But so the one particular situation, um, that morning as I was getting ready to give the talk, my wife, who is an attorney, but not a litigator, um, <laughs> sent me a link, to, a, a link to an ABA blog. Uh, and based on a comment that IBM General Counsel had made, there was this conjecture in the ABA blog that Watson would replace attorneys. Okay. <laughs> So I was trying to make the point that, you know, we're not replacing anybody. And I referenced, you know, I was going to say, and so there's this blog, but that's not true. So I just, anyway, I had to get up there and I started talking. I said, so, and also there's this blog in the ABA about Watson replacing attorneys. And I got a standing ovation. So, <laughs> so you know, I had to change my approach to it to, 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 get the point, to get the point across. So if we talk about what Watson did, okay, 
it played Jeopardy. It, you know, Jeopardy uses intentionally arcane, difficult, obscure language. Language that humans can intuit because you've been living in the language for all these decades. But computers have never really been able to, to break through. And Watson was able to, to do that, to actually understand the language. So the way Watson worked in playing Jeopardy, it was an understand the question. Or in, in, that, in Jeopardy's case, it was an answer for which you had to formulate a question. Okay. And then go and look at large volumes of stored literature. Because the, the rules for playing Jeopardy was that Watson could not go out into the internet during the game. It had to deal with stored data only. Admittedly, it had 12 terabytes of storage, but it, it was all stored. And so it stored like the entirety of Wikipedia, okay, th things like that. So Watson would understand the nature of the stimulus the, of the answer, go out and review all this literature, and come back with a list of possible responses. So if you see this picture here, um, in, in this case, um, it, it, you know, it lists three things. And the, the number of possible responses that Watson would come up with in playing Jeopardy could have been thousands. And by reviewing all the material and evaluating these possible answers, it would come back with a confidence level that any of these responses were relevant to the, the stimulus from Jeopardy. Um, and in this case, it, it, it always showed the top three below the Watson avatar. So in this case, um, albinism was turned out to be the correct response. What is albinism? But it had other things because of these word associations that it thought might be relevant with different, uh, different confidence levels. And, and the rule in, in Jeopardy, uh, since you had to come back with either an answer or no answer, is the answer that had the highest confidence level was the one that Watson would rely on. And during the game, Watson would calculate a threshold, depending on the strategic position in the game, as to how high that level of confidence had to be before it would decide to buzz in. Okay. And so if Watson were way ahead and losing $1,000 wouldn't mean very much, it would set itself a relatively low threshold. If it was a very tight game and losing the money would be important, it would set itself a higher threshold. And so that confidence level, when it exceeded, and that white bar is the threshold that Watson calculated for this point, and in this case, it buzzed in first and, and, uh, uh, and was correct with, with albinism. So that's playing Jeopardy, you know, nice, uh, but um, you know, kind of a one-shot deal. Um, although they are gonna rebroadcast the program sometime later this year. Um, and IBM won a million dollars, got a million dollars from the producer for this, but it donated all that to charity. So we need to move on to healthcare. So let's talk about where, where this fits in. So I mentioned this was a research project that started in 2006, successful in February of 2011. And now we have started to look at Watson's role in other industries, other areas. So we started with healthcare in 2011, and now also working in financial services. In like international banks, when they're deciding whether to buy bonds from a certain country, have to review a huge amount of, of literature. Okay. Um, and you know, if, if a bank wants to decide whether to grant a credit card, you know, it has to review a fair amount of information. So another possibility is, is financial services. We've had not much success, getting back to the lawyers again, in, uh, in Watson for the law, although one would think up front it would be a big deal because they have to read all these precedents and, and appeals and, and transcripts, you know, thousands and thousands of pages. Well, it turns out the business model of the law doesn't want to change. You know, if they have to have somebody read a thousand page transcript, they charge you for it. So coming up a tool that saves you that time so you don't have to read it means they charge you less. So the response we get is, you know, you're going to cost us money if you do it better. So we don't want any part of you. So we're, we're, we're staying away from the law right now. So Watson is part of our overall goal. And sorry if this sounds like a bit of an ad advertisement for IBM. Um, you probably have seen our ads or the discussions of let's be a smarter planet. Smarter planet is smarter healthcare, smarter cities, smarter energy, smarter traffic. And the, the concept of un underlying smarter planet is instrumented. If we're gonna make changes and improve things, then well, we have to be able to measure. So things have to be instrumented and then interconnected. All these things work together. You don't have smarter healthcare without smarter energy or, or smarter transportation. Um, and so while this is interconnected, you collect all, all this information, uh, but then you have to analyze it. Anybody can collect data, but if you don't use it intelligently, turn it into something useful that helps you make better decisions, you've really just wasted your time. So these are three components of this overall smarter planet. And Watson is part of this. You know, we are one of the reasons to, to have some optimism about the role of Watson and you know, the amount of that it can read and understand is we're sort of drowning in data. Okay. 
so certain realities. 90% of the information that exists is less than two years old. Okay. And so that's, that's just going to get worse. Most of that data is unstructured. Okay. The thing about you know, what you do most time is most of the time is reading or hearing, natural language, uh, free text, words. Um, and most traditional um, uh, systems that do any analytics deal with just that 20% that's m more structured. So there's a lot of information out there that we would like to use that we have not been able to use effectively up until now. So if we look at Watson and some of our current analytics as kind of a progression, you know, going back the, you know, to the 20th century, a lot of what we did was tabulation. Okay. My career in healthcare goes back far enough that uh, dealing with analytics meant having an adding machine and column or paper. Then we moved into the, the 80s um, where, uh, you know, where we, you know, I had my first desktop com computer, an IBM XT in 1982 that cost $7,000 and had a 10 megabyte hard drive. We thought that was, you know, more than you, you, you could ever use. Um, so we, ha we have these deterministic applications. I could track how many visits there were in the emergency department, how many patients got admitted, what the trends were, but, you know, basic deterministic uh, stuff. And you had to, uh, you didn't have a lot of tools uh, that helped you do the, the analytics. You had to program them yourselves. And now we're dealing with big data, data that is so huge, people cannot encompass it. Okay. And we're looking at predictive analytics. What's going to happen in, in the future if, if we continue a trend or, or um, or, or change things, and focusing more on natural language because there's so much of what we need to do is in there. So these are the changes that, that are evolving. So how does Watson fit into this? Okay. Watson understands natural language. I had some interesting discussions with the chief residents yesterday about does Watson really understand? And I would argue that it does okay. because it understands the, the, the meaning. And it, without being able to understand that, it would not have been able to play Jeopardy. I mean, if you think about the Jeopardy clues, they're odd language. You know, there are puns, and, and Watson had to understand that something was a pun, and then understand the meaning of the pun, and then go out and understand it well enough to look at all these pages of, of literature and pull out that which might be relevant. So you know, depending on how existential you want to be, I, I think that qualifies as, as understanding. And Watson generates hypotheses. Right? So that, that example in playing Jeopardy. Um, in, in healthcare, in other areas, Watson will generate a large number of hypotheses. When it was playing Jeopardy, it actually would generate hundreds or maybe even thousands of hypotheses as to what was an appropriate response. And then it would evaluate each of those hypotheses using additional information to decide which were relevant. So it, uh, it generates hypotheses. Now, the rule in, in Jeopardy is Watson had to come back with a single answer or no answer. Okay. That won't be its role in healthcare for a variety of reasons. Healthcare is inherently less deterministic. There may not be, in fact, there rarely is just a single answer. There may be lots of things to think about. So Watson will, in, will have an understanding of the question you have to resolve and then bring back to you a list of ideas for you to consider in making your decision. Okay. So it may come back, you know, if you're trying to make a diagnosis, it may come back with five or six diagnoses that you ought to think about. That's fundamentally how Watson always worked, but it had to change um, its style because of the Jeopardy rules. You know, it wasn't allowed, for instance, to come up with, well, I have these five ideas about the right response, Alec, you pick which one, which one you want. Okay. You couldn't do that. Okay. Uh, so, but in, in, in healthcare, that is what it, what it does. It'll do, it'll come back with a list of ideas for you to think about with confidence levels that each of these things is relevant to the decision you have to make. So Watson won't be a decision maker It'll be decision support and bringing ideas to you uh, for, for you to make part of, of, uh, of, of your decision process. And Watson adapts and learns. Okay. It's a natural language processing tool, but it's a learning system called machine learning. So the more Watson played Jeopardy, the better it got. The way Watson was trained to play Jeopardy, it was fed tens of thousands of previous answer question pairs from other Jeopardy programs. Now that's you know that's pretty straightforward because nominally there was a correct answer, so it was it was fed a Jeopardy answer. Watson had to come back with with with, uh, uh, with a question, so it was first given thousands of questions with the known answer, so we could learn what a correct answer looked like, and then it was tested by giving it thousands more Jeopardy answers and seeing what kind of answer it came back with, and was told this is right, this is wrong. And then we'll say, okay, you were wrong, but the right answer is one of your top five. And then Watson would go back 
and adjust itself in a variety of ways to improve its performance. So Watson is what its designers um, call a, a system of massively parallel probabilistic algorithms. That's as much as I know about computer language. Please don't ask me any other questions about that. Okay. But it's, it's a series of hundreds on the order of a thousand algorithms, mathematical algorithms that parse break down English. So it had a set of algorithms that were designed to detect whether the stimulus was a pun. Once having determined that it was a pun, it had another set of algorithms to understand the pun, and then another set of algorithms to go out and search for relevant information. And so one of the things Watson would do if it got an answer correct, it would look at the algorithms that pointed it in the right direction and weight those up. And if, uh, if it looked at the algorithms that pointed it in the wrong direction and downweight those. And so it would learn over time which algorithms are more valuable for certain kinds of questions and teach itself to, to do better. So when they first started with Watson um, back in 2006, 2007, against Jeopardy questions, uh, if Watson answered the questions in which it was most confident only, it had about a 40% accuracy rate, correct rate. Um, but the more questions it answered, and obviously you have to answer a large number of the questions here if you have a chance of winning the game, they, it got down to about 15% accuracy if it answered 70% of the questions. By the time they were ready to play Jeopardy, okay, it was answering at the rate of 85% correct, because that's the level it had to be in order to take on the Jeopardy champions. Because they studied Ken Jennings' work in particular, and it turned out Ken Jennings buzz, buzzed in first 80% of the time and was correct 75 to 80% of the time. So basically, he won by dominating the board, letting his co-contestants squabble over a quarter of the questions while he got most of the questions right. And they asked him how he was able to, to do that. And what he said is he buzzed in when he was confident by the time the three seconds were up, he would know the answer. All the other contestants waited until they knew the answer or thought they knew the answer. He got to a point where he said, I will know the answer in another second. I'm going to buzz in now. Okay. So Watson had to compete against that. So it really didn't even have the three seconds. It had like, like two seconds. So the first time the Jeopardy producers came to our labs to look at Jeopardy um, at, at Watson, Watson was in about the 70% correct range. And they said, that's not good enough. That's not going to be a contest. Six months later, they came back and Watson was at the 85% level. And they said, OK, we're going to have the problem now. If he gives you another six months, you guys are going to be so good, it won't be a contest in the other direction. So that was the, the timing for it. So it adapts and learns. It's called machine learning. It teaches itself, as well as being you know, modified and, and, and updated by, by its designers. It also looks at the information that it uses. So as I mentioned, stored 12 terabytes of data. Okay. It also looked at the value of the stored information. So if it found that a certain source very often gave it ideas that turned into correct responses, it would give a higher reliability index to that particular source. If using a source found it very rarely gave it good information, it would give a lower reliability. So Watson, in fact, participated itself in deciding what information would be stored. So it worked on all ends. It strategically you know, confidence in the answer, uh, um, reliability index of, of the sources from both sides, and adjusting its algorithms to improve it, its performance. Why is it hard for computers to understand language? Our language is confusing, almost nonsensical. Yeah. You know, noses that run, feet that smell. Yeah. A wise man and a wise guy are the opposite. Okay. Okay. We're comfortable with that because we've used those terms. We, 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 we live there. I don't know if you remember the old George Carlin routines. Why do we park on a driveway and drive on a parkway? Okay. You know, it, it makes no sense, you know, except in context. So um, you know, understanding all this was the challenge. And Watson can resolve these kinds of things. So again, I would argue that that means that there is understanding here. And so if you look at one of the Jeopardy stimuli, um, the actual question, if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved himself a master painter during his tenure at GE. Okay. Watson had to understand that master painter did not mean that his oils were hanging in the metropolitan. It referred to a total, you know, just an analogy to some other total skill. This was, it was all part of what it had to do. So if you look at healthcare now, certain realities, medical information is doubling every five years. Okay. Most of it is unstructured, text-like. The National Library of Medicine last year cataloged something on the order of 800,000 new articles. I did not read them all. Okay. Um, survey of physicians. So basically, four-fifths of phys physicians have five hours or less each month to read. And even if you've read it, there's no guarantee that you remember it. One of my health policy colleagues, who's a little bit of a wag, 
express it this way. If, if a physician read one article a night, in, a night in his or her specialty for a year, at the end of that year, they'd only be 10 years behind. A lot of information out there. So, you know, imagine, you know, you're, you're trying to make a difficult decision. You've done the usual sort of reading. You have your usual level, level of expertise. What kind of difference would it make if you had, as a colleague, you know, as a supporter, uh, somebody who read voluminously and remembered everything and understood and could bring back to you relevant information, okay? And as you were making decisions, present, let's talk about these. You're trying to make a diagnosis. Let's talk about these 10 possible diagnoses when you're making your decision. How much more likely would you be able to be to make a better, more evidence supported decision? If that sounds attractive to you, then that's what Watson does. So, um, you know, whether you're thinking about diagnosis or uh, um, therapeutic decisions, it, it's all relevant. And if we put it in the context of what we're trying to do with the transformation of healthcare, okay, the, the, the future goal of healthcare, you know, ha, ha, has several objectives. We want to improve health for the population. We want to improve outcomes for individuals. We want to control costs. We want to eliminate the unnecessary. Some of the estimates are that 20 to 30% of what's spent on healthcare in the United States is for interventions that are either useless or frankly dangerous. So one of our goals is to reduce that. Now, I don't want to pick on cardiologists, but you know, there are probably some um, you know, uh, cath studies and for gastroenterologists, some endoscopies that really have no specific indication, don't provide any value at the end. And so the approach ought to be, if you're going to do the test, you know, is it going to change the outcome? Is it going to change your decision? And if that, if that outcome of that test doesn't change your decision, then you probably shouldn't, shouldn't do it. So that, that's one of our goals. So Watson can help with that. Okay. And, and, and by bringing this evidence and uh, suggesting things to you, move in that direction. So one of the things that Watson, one of Watson's capabilities, which was not apparent in playing Jeopardy, is Watson is interactive. It knows what it doesn't know. So you feed some information into Watson. Say you're making a diagnosis. And um, Watson processes it and can come back with a list of ideas. Here's some things for you to think about. But um, in my reading, it tells me that we need a little more information about the patient. Uh, does the patient have a bleeding disorder? If you told me whether or not the patient had a bleeding disorder, that would have a big impact on my suggestions to you. So you may want to think about asking that of the patient. Or this test, the outcome of this test, I believe would have a big impact on my priorities of, 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 the, of, the, of the suggestions I have for you. You may want to think about doing that test. So it's interactive. And so you give it that information, give it back to Watson, and Watson starts all over again. It comes back with some new suggestions for you. So it, it couldn't show that interaction in playing Jeopardy. It couldn't go out and say, Alex, I want a little more information. It, it, it wasn't, wasn't part of the rules. But it does do that um, in, in, in healthcare. So if we just quickly how Watson actually works, it has the question and analyzes the question. And then um, it comes up with a long list of answers. Um, it interprets, uses hundreds of sources to come up with a list of answers. So using the Jeopardy, Jeopardy analogy, the first thing Watson would do when it understood the Jeopardy stimulus is go to what it considered answer sources, because it wants to create a very long list of possible responses. And Wikipedia was amongst those that it considered answer sources. Answer sources. Found that going to Wikipedia was a good way to get lots of entries on your initial list of, of possible responses. Then what it do with having had this long list, would then go to other kinds of information that it would consider evidence sources. And it would use those sources to collect the evidence necessary to evaluate the quality of each of the answers on its answer list. So it would say, OK, this answer, number one, I found it in Wikipedia, but there's no other source, not the New England Journal, not the New York Times, um, and not the Encyclopedia Britannica. Nobody else thinks this is correct. So I'm going to give a very low confidence level that I'm going to push it down to the bottom. But this answer, five other sources also identify this as, as likely. I'm going to give this a high confidence level and, and push it up to the top. So it creates a long list of possible answers and then evaluates each of them in detail. 
And then when it's finally all done, it comes back with this confidence level. Now, there's no guarantee that that's correct. If you watched any of the program, you know, Watson came up with some really bizarre answers. Okay. Um, so it's not perfect. Um, the most famous one is um, name, it, well, the category was US cities. And the question was, you know, two airports, one named after a battle, one named after a war hero. And Watson came back with Toronto. <laughs> and so, so that was interesting for a couple of reasons. One, uh, Watson had a very low confidence level, justifiably, a very low confidence level on that answer. It was a double jeopardy question. So it had no ch choice but to respond. If it had been a conventional question, it would have declined. And it shows how Watson processes evidence and categories of evidence and qualities of evidence. Watson had learned over time, uh, correct or not, that the name of the category in Jeopardy was relatively little value in making any decisions. So it minimized the impact of the category in its deliberations. When right after that game, Watson was asked directly, in what US city, it got it right. It just didn't use that evidence. And it got it right with a very high confidence level because it, then it used the information about US city. But so if this had been a conventional question, it would not have embarrassed itself because it wouldn't have buzzed in. Okay. So the net result of all this process is coming back with these answers and confidence levels. So if you're thinking about making a diagnosis, Watson will come back with a list for your differential diagnosis for you to think about. There's, there's no obligation for you to use it. It's like talking to somebody. Do you have any ideas about this? Watson will come up and you may say, that first one is off the wall. It's not possibly relevant. I don't know where you got that from. Number two, yeah, I already thought of that. Number three, hmm, I'm not really sure about that. Uh, interesting. Maybe I'll have to think about that some more. And if you want to think about it in depth, if you click on that suggestion, Watson will take you back to the original literature that it used to create that suggestion. And it will even outline the, the phrases in the article that it thought were most relevant and show that to you. So it's a chance to, to explore. I had no idea that Trogan syndrome could show up that way. Why do you think that? And it'll take you back to, to, to the articles. So, you know, it's clinical decision support in a very specific way. It brings these ideas to your attention. It's what some informaticists call a hybrid system. Watson does some upfront work at which you're not very good, which is reading huge volumes. Brings back these ideas and you as the expert to do the deep dive and make the final decision using those suggestions as suggestions. So it doesn't ever say, this is the answer. It says, these are things worth thinking about. Okay. So you can see why in that model, it's not replacing anybody. Okay, it, that, 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 that's not the goal here. Okay. So if, in watching Jeopardy, it, it would be possible to think that Watson was uh, really just a, uh, a, a search engine um, on steroids. And in fact, in 2006, that was their original design idea, is that they would have this huge database because uh, the, the Jeopardy game was so discreet, they would just have this huge database and they would look at the categories of questions that, uh, that Jeopardy posed and do a, a, a super lookup. And it, it turned out that th there were so many categories that, in Jeopardy that this model just didn't work. And they found that working with this database kind of model failed because if you didn't formulate the inquiry for, for the database in exactly the right way, you got nonsense back. So they moved away from that model to this um, a massively parallel probabilistic system. So look at a difference between um, a search engine and Watson. Um, this was one of the actual Jeopardy stimuli. In May 1898, uh, Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of this explorer's arrival in India. Okay. Now, uh, if you, you put together some keywords and did a regular search, you might hit this, this page from Facebook. It said, in, in May, Gary arrived in India after he celebrated his anniversary in Portugal. On a keyword search, that's a five keyword match. Okay. So if you Google this or something, you would have a high on that list of hits would be this page about Gary. Now it wouldn't come out and say, think about Gary as the explorer. It would link you to a page that has all these words on it. So you would have to go and read this page to determine, I think would be your, your decision that Gary isn't the explorer. Okay. But it's still a five keyword match. At least I hope that's your decision. Watson does some keyword work, but it actually breaks down and understands the language. I mentioned it, these massively parallel probabilistic algorithms. So, and these algorithms are distributed in, in, in categories. So three of the categories are temporal reasoning, statistical paraphrasing, and geospatial reasoning. 
amongst the, the many, many hundreds. And so it, Watson would think, well, May 1898, the 400th anniversary, that lines up with this page I found, uh, 27th of May, uh, 1498. Uh, arrival in could be a paraphrase of landed in, and Coppet Beach is in India. So if I put that together with all my other algorithms, I want to come back and say, you know, Vasco da Gama looks like a name you ought to think about. And it in turn, in fact, had a very high confidence level in Vasco da Gama and buzzed in and said Vasco da Gama. So it didn't take you to a page about Vasco da Gama. It actually came up, think about Vasco da Gama. So very different. Now, these are three of the categories of, 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 of analytic uh, algorithms. And, and, and there are many, many others, most of which are too complex for me to other, other understand or explain. But these are pretty straightforward ones. And you can imagine how this would carry over into healthcare. Uh, temporal um, reasoning. We know the temporal progression of a patient's symptoms are relevant to our decision making. Uh, last winter, I was jogging and I got chest pain after a half hour. Uh, this spring, I was uh, mowing the lawn. I pushed the lawnmower up the hill and I got some chest pain. And now, if if I get up from the chair, I get chest pain. That kind of progression, Watson would understand and, and include that information. Geospatial, you know, anatomic. You know, thread of my fingers went to my shoulder, then my chest. Statistical paraphrasing. Um, probably the most obvious example is the difference between the way patients use language and we use language. So, you know, I'm seeing a patient in the emergency department and the patient says, I'm dizzy. So amongst other things, I tell Watson, the patient is dizzy. Watson will process it, come back with some suggestions for me to think about, but also say, oh, by the way, my reading tells me that um, dizzy is an ambiguous term. You may think it means vertigo, but the patient may not be using it that way. You know, so that, you know, patients can, you know, can use when they're depressed or they've lost their appetite or I'm dizzy with excitement, you know, all kinds of different. So Watson would say, if you can clarify for me what this patient means by dizzy, I can do a better job. So give me that information and, and I will try again. That's the, the, the interactive and its ability to understand ambiguity um, in, in language. So, you know, the Watson playing Jeopardy, you know, there was one user, one question, um, if, uh, Watson had to, you know, change its, its sources for information because it found something invaluable. It took like five days to retrain. It, it dealt with stored information. The Watson for healthcare is you're going to have potentially thousands of concurrent users. You know, the, the, the typical stimulus in Jeopardy was between five and, and 12 words. Okay. Reading a healthcare record is substantially more complicated than that. So it's going to be a very different um, process. It won't um, rely on stored data. Okay, and we won't have to worry about currency of the data because we're getting licenses with most of the major publishers to get online access to the most recent literature. So it's going to be a, a, a very different, uh, very different environment, and we're looking at all, all sorts of things. So how do we adapt to this new, uh, new domain? Uh, we have to recognize that this information is going to be in different formats. Um, what are the triggers we would use to interpret an article in the New England Journal of Medicine as compared to, to Wikipedia? Um, Training on these new, very complex questions uh, on you know, what is inflammation, um, things like that. And so new concepts and new reasoning uh, associations that are not part of, of the, the routine for something as simplistic as Jeopardy. As complex as it was to play Jeopardy, the, 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 the questions were fairly simplistic. So as an example of retraining Watson for, for healthcare, the, the baseline Jeopardy version without any change the one that, that won Jeopardy that was turned loose on healthcare, and it was turned loose first on the, the, uh, the Board of Internal Medicine doctor's dilemma questions. Okay. Um, if it looked at the questions in which was most confident, that couple of percent which was most confident, it got 100% correct. But as soon as it started to want to answer more questions, if it answered every question, it was about 20% correct. Okay. So, you know, it needed a lot more work to get. So, um, they uh, added some additional content to it over the content that it was using in healthcare and got a little, uh, and Jeopardy got a little uh, more improvement. They started training it, changing its algorithms, training it by feeding it sets of known questions and answers to, uh, so it could learn and, and it improved. Um, and then they changed some, some of its function to interpret this information better and they start, uh, started to improve. Then, you know, consistent with what I suggested that Watson, we, we don't want Watson Healthcare to come back with the answer, but to come up with a list of possible answers for you to think about. If we looked at how often Watson had what was nominally the correct answer in its top 10 choices, then it hit 77%. So that's the, the point it got to with these kind of discrete questions. Now, 
these questions are fairly straightforward. Some of them are multiple choice, you know, a single answer kind of thing. Not really the, the, the same thing as, as the real world in healthcare. I'm sure we've all had experience with colleagues who do really well on these kinds of tests and are useless in the clinical environment. So this was just kind of a, credi a credibility. I'm sure it's nobody here. I understand that. Okay. Okay. So we are working now with Memorial Sloan Kettering to teach Watson about oncology. Okay, is our first step. And in a sense, this is a credibility step. Okay. Watson is potential right now. Everybody is excited by the potential. But the question is, can it really actually do anything useful in healthcare besides answer doctor's dilemma questions? So we're working with Memorial Stone Kettering um, for this purpose. And why, why Memorial Stone Kettering and why cancer? Well, you know, cancer is you know, responsible for one in four deaths. It's a very expensive area of healthcare, increasingly so. So the, the cost of cancer management, as fast as the rest of healthcare, is increasing. And cancer is three times as fast. Okay. Getting very complex. Uh, the nature of cancer therapy decisions is changing. Uh, the, the genetics are becoming more dominant over the physical location. A lot more decisions to, to be made. Uh, to be made. Uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering has 1.2 million electronic health records going back over 10 years on cancer patients. And it has the expertise, the experts like Dr. Mark Chris, who's chief of thoracic oncology, um, to, to help us with this. So we are teaching Watson oncology. Um, in part to give it its first taste of healthcare, and with the goal of proving credibility that Watson actually can usefully participate in therapeutic decision making um, in in this area, and that and then having proven that it, it will extend. So, if we look at um, some graphics or an understanding of the typical decision process in healthcare, we can see some reasons to be optimistic about Watson's future. Uh, this is from the New England Journal a few years ago. It's a uh, this author's um, graphic representation of the um, diagnostic decision-making process. Uh, you start off with the patient's story. You know, you ask some questions, collect a little bit of information, and to start to form in your mind a, a, a representation of this patient's problem. Um, then you start to generate hypotheses of possible diagnoses that, that you think about. If you were making a diagnosis, you start to formulate your, your uh, a differential diagnosis. And then you collect more information, you may order some tests, and then you create what this author calls the illness script, a, a complete understanding of what you think is going on with this patient, and then you come up with your diagnosis. If we look at these patterns okay, and understand the kinds of human behavior that result in errors, decision errors, we can see some role for Watson. I, I spent many years doing risk management analysis and medical malpractice consulting and actually have studied the human behavior of errors in decision. And the effect is a society that exists, just the Society for Study of Errors and Decision Errors in Medicine, the SDIM, that looks at this stuff. And so we have some good ideas about the five or six human behaviors that consistently show up when uh, important decision errors have, have occurred. One of these behaviors is the flaw of availability. The idea that um, if you haven't thought about it, or you didn't remember it, or you didn't know about it, it's not going to be on your list. Now, that wouldn't be completely bad if humans were more open than, than they usually are. Okay? If you went with the understanding that, you know, this may not be everything. You know, this is what I can think of, but maybe something is missing. If you, that was your, your mindset, it wouldn't be too bad. But that is compounded by a second common human flaw, not just related to physicians or clinicians, but the human flaw what's that behaviorally is called self-reinforcing perception bias. Okay. I am so proud of my brilliance <laughs> and having coming up with this differential that now I am going to look for information intentionally that supports my original hypotheses. And if I come across anything that's inconsistent, I'm going to ignore it. And uh, um, information technologists call it anchor bias, but behaviorists call it self-reinforcing perception bias. Probably explains why most politicians get reelected. Okay. So how does Watson mitigate against that? Okay, it mitigates against flaw of availability. So I mentioned it comes up with a huge list of answers, of responses, not just the first few. It looks for intentionally a long list mitigates against self-reinforcing perception bias. Cause the second step I mentioned is it researches each of the possible answers on its list to determine whether they make any sense or not. So those two steps, again, it's not perfect, but it acts against two of the behaviors 
that specifically lead to decision errors. So by bringing those ideas forward to you, you know, you can say, gee, I really should have thought of that. I forgot all about it. You know, Watson can help with that. So if we look briefly at Watson from the high level, um, its designer, Dave Ferrucci, uh, calls Watson a shallow reasoner, meaning that Watson looks at huge volumes of information with an understanding of the question you have to resolve and brings the ideas back to you. Watson doesn't do the deep dive to come up with the final set of diagnoses or therapies. That is left to you, the expert on the scene, working with the patient, with your team, to use that information to, to make that, that the final decision. So Watson helps us by doing that which we cannot do. Okay? We can't read you know, a million pages a second. You know, Watson can. So it does that which we can't do, pulls out all that information, evidence supported to you to help you make that, make that decision. And it's interactive, as I mentioned. If it needs more information, I'll ask for it. But it suggests to you. It doesn't tell you you must do this. You, know, you may want to ask the patient about hemoptysis, for example. So um, for looking at, again, the, the changes we have to make, Watson has to now understand new associations, new, new kinds of, of questions. Um, it has to be able to learn to evaluate evidence. Okay. It can do some of that by crowdsourcing, in effect, when, when it was playing Jeopardy, and to some extent in healthcare. You know, if that same information appeared in lots of places, it would be more confident. Okay. It could be the same thing in healthcare. If a similar report is in the New England Journal and the British Medical Journal and, and the Annals of Internal Medicine and the AMA, they all say the same thing, you know, Watson can be fairly confident. If it appears only in the Southern Chilean Journal of Nephrology, maybe not. But Watson is also being taught how to understand and interpret the quality of a specific study. So for example, it's being taught about N. So if it has two conflicting studies, one has a small N, the other has a very large N, to give more uh, credence to the one with the large N, things like that. So it's being taught actually to evaluate the quality of evidence. It's what we call informed evidence analysis. So not only looking at large numbers of articles, but, I, but analyzing individual articles. And then that comes up with you know, how to assess confidence in healthcare as it did for playing Jeopardy. Um, and then it goes to this batch training that I, that I you know, analogous to playing Jeopardy, is with Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, once Watson is taught the basics of what are the important attributes in a healthcare and a, a cancer patient, it'll be fed thousands of cases from Memorial Sloan Kettering's records that include the nominally correct decision for therapy. And Watson will ingest that. And then it'll be fed thousands more and ask Watson to come up with a therapy. And the oncologist will say, yes, that's on target. This is not. So this is just credibility. You know, if Watson comes back with ideas that the experts say are reasonable, then that's credibility. It's not the end point, because we know those decisions can be very subjective. You know, but if Watson keeps on coming back with things that the oncologists say are nonsense, we know we're, we're in trouble. But you know, right now, so one of the things we're doing right now is focusing on the NCCN guidelines for cancer therapy. But most oncologists acknowledge this is a consensus document. It's not truly an evidence-supported set of guidelines. So again, we get through this for credibility. And then the next step is opening Watson up to all these sources of information. Let Watson process that and bring the ideas from that to your therapeutics. We're focusing on therapy. Um, with Memorial Sloan Kettering in large part because most all the patients that get to Memorial, uh, by the time they get there, they have a definitive diagnosis. Only a very small fraction get changed. So we're focusing on, 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 on therapy. So you know, it, we will be moving on to this as soon as we show credibility that Watson can reasonably navigate the standard guidelines and come up with things that the oncologists agree are, are reasonable. So this is a, a screenshot of what the interaction, one of the interactions with the decision maker might look at. The other thing we're teaching Watson to do is to consider patient preferences, a relatively new idea in, in, in healthcare, that, that patients actually have some say. Okay. And one of the goals for the future of healthcare is the, it's called the empowered, knowledgeable patient. We want patients in the future to participate in the decision-making process. We want them to understand their health situation and how a care plan would affect that or how not following the care plan would affect that. Because we have, you know, we have problems that, Still, you know, this year, 30% of prescriptions never get filled. Of those, roughly half never get taken properly. And why does that happen? Why do patients not follow what appears to be 
um, uh, completed reasonable care plans. And in part, it's because they're not part of the decision process. They really you know, don't have any stake in it um, other than this theoretical advantage. So um, one of the things we're talking about is patient preference. And this column over here is whether or not this treatment plan is consistent with the patient's preference. And so we're incorporating that. And the ideas of patient preferences are, are changing. Um, if there are any oncologists in the room, I apologize if I'm speaking out of turn. But traditionally, oncologists uh, value a treatment plan based on its median survival. If a treatment plan has a longer median survival than another one and acceptable side effects, then that becomes their preferred treatment. Uh, there was an article this spring in the journal Health Affairs testing how patients thought about that. And they took two patients with uh, metastatic uh, groups of patients with metastatic breast cancer and with melanoma and offered them two different kinds of treatment. So as, as you know, in, in uh, the survival curves, the, the median survival is when half the patients have died. But in all those survival curves, there's always a tale of patients that have lived a very long time. So they offered two treatment plans, one with the longest median survival and another with a shorter median survival, but a slightly thicker tail, slight likelihood of living much longer. Three quarters of the patients chose the one with the thicker tail and the shorter median survival. Very different from what oncologists expected. And um, they had a sociologist who argued when the door is being slammed in your face, you'll take any chance at keeping the door open sort of thing. So incorporating that information and how that would affect the options for therapy are part of what Watson is being trained to do. So in, in this case, it's gone through this process. And this is a patient who, for cultural reasons, was, was a young woman who, um, who was concerned about hair loss, wanted as much as possible to retain her hair because that was part of her, her culture for, for a woman. And so it turned out with all this processing that Treatment plan one, in which Watson had a high degree of confidence that it was likely to, you know, to be a good choice therapeutically, was acceptable to the patient because it, had, it, it helped her keep most of her hair. The one she would have preferred that had no hair loss also was lousy therapeutically. So after discussion and so on with the oncologist and the, with the patient, they decided that treatment plan one was the one they would go. The oncologist was happy because it was reasonable therapeutic, therapeutically. The patient was happy because she'd keep most of her hair. Then we get the next step, you know, which frustrates oncologists and lots of physicians. You now have to ask the insurance company if they'll pay for it, right? Big step. Another article in the Journal of Health Affairs last year compared Canadian and American physicians on the cost of interacting with payers. In Canada, which is fundamentally single payer, the cost for the average physician of interacting with the payer system was $21,000 a year. In the United States, it's $83,000 a year. For the average physician, that's the cost of the physician's time in making phone calls, filling out paperwork, hiring billing people in the office, and so on. It turns out to be one-sixth of practice revenue goes to interacting with the payers. Tremendous burden. So one-sixth of the practice revenue is, is sterile, useless expenditure just to feed a bureaucracy. And the payers have a similar bureaucracy. They have nurses that review this stuff. They have a physician panel that reviews it further. Uh, and it can take three or four weeks sometimes for this to happen. So you have this poor patient who has just been told, you have cancer, but we're gonna have to wait a month to get approval before we can treat you. Now, one of the reasons we like with Memorial Sloan Kettering is they don't wait for that. They say if the patient needs it, we're going to give it to them. And if the insurance company doesn't pay for it, we'll eat it. That, that's a little unusual. That's not, that's not the standard model. So we are working with insurance companies such as WellPoint um, on this collaborative model. Our, our goal is to support the, the future of healthcare, the transform healthcare, where all the stakeholders in healthcare collaborate and work together, use the same information, use the same evidence to make decisions, have the same goals of simultaneously improving health and controlling costs, not just the, the HMO models of the 70s and 80s where the only goal was controlling utilization, but the dual of cost and, and quality. And so there's this little button over here, request pre-auth. Okay. Okay. We're working with the insurance company so that everybody's on board, that if Watson was involved in this and accept the fact that if Watson's making these recommendations and they are acceptable and get followed, that this is evidence-supported decision-making, both sides buy into this. Dr. Chris presses that button and bing, it comes back authorized. So the patient can start therapy that day, not a month later. So that's really part of the win-win-win the situation. The providers win 
their process is much simplified. They don't have to make a phone call, fax something, wait for three weeks, ask for more information, go back and forth and waste their time. The payer wins because they no longer need this cumbersome bureaucracy to process this stuff. And the patient wins because one of the goals of the future is the patient experience. How much better, you know, I'm never going to say that having cancer is a good experience, but how much less bad an experience it is if you don't have to sit around for a month waiting to get a decision as to whether you're going to get your therapy or not. So th this is part of the goal, and this is what the, the interface with, with Watson would look like uh, for oncology. Um, so how will Watson be used in the future? One of our models is basically uh, IBM would you know, maintain Watson, and it would be accessible through a cloud, so that you would use you know, basically a subscription service to use Watson. You know, submit information, Watson would process it for you. And if we let our imaginations run wild, if we work with enough organizations and have access to enough information and clinical data, the uh, uh, identify clinical data about lots of patients accessible, then you can collect information about your patient by studying millions of other patients that are similar to that and, and bring that back. So um, it, it could really fundamentally change the, the dynamic of, of, of decision making. So actually, we're looking at healthcare, financial services, one of the other direct projects with healthcare is this prior authorization process. The way WellPoint does it, if you submit a request, there's a panel of nurses that decide whether to approve it or pass it on to a group of physicians. And, um, but they, they, they're not in the position of denying it. Well, Watson, we actually have an active application now that they are using with Watson to help improve the reliability of, of that decision-making process. So it is shortening the time it takes to make those decisions and, and makes it less expensive. Um, talking about being developed for use in contact centers, all that contact center information is free text equivalent voice that gets transcribed or recorded. Watson will be working with contact centers for that. So um, then the, the potential for the future is, um, is even broader. If we, um, Watson is natural language processing. It understands English. At some future time, it may be other languages, but it, it's the difference between just recognizing words and understanding the, 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 the meaning of the language. So if it moves into other languages, it, it'll be quite a challenge, and that'll happen sometime in the future. But you know, this took four years just to get it to understand English. We're looking at other kinds of analytics, too, that deal with the structured data, the numerical data, and image data. So we have this other technique that we call patient similarity analysis, which is a comparative effect in this population observational kind of methodology. Where so you're dealing with a patient and you describe this patient in many, many different ways, potentially 10,000 characteristics for this patient. Okay. Am I running over time? I thought I had a couple more minutes. Okay. Um, so you have your index patient that you describe, a 65 year old male of Asian descent who's got emphysema and congestive heart failure and um, uh, may have diabetes and worked in a coal mine and been married three times. You know, all the char all characters you may attribute to, to this patient. And it can be tens of thousands of characteristics that describe this patient. Then you look in the population of patients for which you have information, maybe a couple of million patients, a couple of million records, and call out from those records a cohort of patients that are substantially similar to your index patient. Okay. And they do a comparative effectiveness analysis. You can say, well, this patient has all these characteristics. If I look at all these other patients that have the same characteristics and look for differences, I may see something that tells me a certain treatment program or certain effort gets a better result for patients like this. So it's a step towards personalizing healthcare, which is one of our goals. You, know, you may be diabetic, but if I treat you just as a diabetic without considering all the other attributes of you as a person, the care is going to be sub suboptimal. And you can think about all the conflicts we have in healthcare. You have the patient with advanced coronary artery disease and asthma. Okay. You want to give a beta blocker to the patient with advanced coronary artery disease, but you know it's going to make their asthma worse. How do you understand what is, in fact, going to be an optimal management plan for that patient? Okay. Because you, you can't think of just one disease or the other. So that, we use this with a, a large healthcare system in Southern California, focusing on challenging diabetics. Challenging diabetics being those diabetics whose hemoglobin A1C was routinely outside the desirable range. And developed a cohort of patients that were substantially similar, including that characteristic, but similar in, ver in, in other ways too. And what we found is that 10% of the physicians in that organization routinely did a better job with patients like this. Now, it didn't say why. That was up to the organization to deep dive and find out why. 
but consistently this 10% of the doctors got better outcomes for these patients. Now, understand that carefully. It did not say these guys were great doctors or great at managing diabetes and the other doctors were terrible. What it said is these doctors get better outcomes for patients like this with all these characteristics. So that allows the organization at least two options. One, let's see what this 10, these 10% 10 did that the others haven't been doing and we can learn. Or number two, let's personalize things. So I have these patients that fit into this cohort. I'm gonna to suggest to them that they see one of these doctors that seems to be designed for them. So imagine this information now being fed to Watson. Okay. So in addition to reading the New England Journal and, 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 and JAMA, uh, Watson gets this information from the patient's similarity core and says, oh, by the way, besides using this treatment and this test, you may want to think about referring this patient to Dr. Jones because he's an endocrinologist that gets really good outcomes for patients just like yours. So a step towards personalizing healthcare. So if we let our imaginations run wild or so, with some behaviors called willful suspension of disbelief okay, of what the future could be, if Watson could gather this evidence from all these other sources, from for, for predictive analytic tools and things like patient similarity, in addition to reading the literature. And then we have other tools that analyze images and do similarity cohorts with patients that have very much the same kind of images. Uh, so we did that with a large, another large health organization where they looked at cardiac patients and they look at their echocardiograms and their cath studies and their electric cardiograms and their nuclear medicine studies as well as other clinical information and formed cohorts of similar patients. And they found in this one example that the greatest majority of patients in this pattern had aortic stenosis as their diagnosis. But there were a bunch of other, a fraction of the other patients that had other valvular diagnoses. So they asked the cardiologist to go back and look at this group of patients. And a fair number of those who didn't have aortic stenosis as their diagnosis, in fact, had aortic stenosis. So again, more information that would be fed into your decision-making process, perhaps through Watson, and achieve that goal of more evidence-supported decisions more personalized care, being able to focus in on the individual patient, make those better decisions and move us towards that triple aim goal of improving population health, improving the patient experience and controlling per capita cost. So again, this is in the future. Watson is very early on, but we're, we're quite you know, excited and confident about where we think this role would be, especially in conjunction with the other tools.